It is June the 12th, 2021, and you're watching The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. And we're back with another episode of The Future of Photography. I'm Chris, there's uh, Jeremiah, there's Adrian. Hello. Hello. Imar isn't here today, but I think she'll be back next week. So it's the three of us trying to... Uh, figure something out about the blackest black. Well, let me let me put it this way: how how did how did this whole thing come into existence? The idea for this episode, and it came because a a listener of one of my German podcasts of Happy Shooting asked me uh, or told me he would go and get IR flock. Have you heard of IR flock? Some kind that of backdrop the, fabric. It is a fabric. It's a yes. flock that absor that absorbs light. It is intensely. A, it is a fabric that absorbs like ninety nine point five percent of the light. And he told me he's gonna get it for his photography. And I started questioning: Do you really need that? Is it really that important to have something that absorbs almost all the light? So I went into a bit of a rabbit hole and dug into into Vanta Black, which I think probably everyone has heard of by now, which is the most famous black paint. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it, there's a bit of a contro controversy about that. We'll probably get into that. Um, which started a couple of three years ago, possibly. Jeremiah, do you know maybe when, a little, when this maybe came a little, out? Maybe, I think maybe even five years ago it was announced and then... Right. Uh, then it was again very controversial because uh, I know everyone that I know went, "Oh, I got to get that! <laughs> I want that! I want to paint my car." <laughs> and uh, I've I've seen I've seen I've well I've looked into it back then, but now I looked into it a bit deeper. And the whole story about um, this company making Vanta Black and it's I don't even know how much I think ninety nine point nine six five percent of light disappears in it so it is pretty much like you're looking uh, if you paint something with it you you, you look at into a black hole pretty much that doesn't reflect almost any light and and um, while it's intriguing i always wondered is it really necessary does it really add anything uh in your photography it so, subtracts. So I was going to say, I'm pretty sure it subtracts. Yeah, <laughs> it's very true. So, so does it, in the question you should be asking is, does it really subtract from your photography? <laughs> true, very true. That's a good point. So, uh, anyway, Vanta Black. Um, we'll go into the controversy in, in a minute, and then there's other things that came out. Um, well, no, let's I, actually let's actually go into the controversy because it leads to another black and to other colors. So that's um, right, there's yes. a there's an artist called Anish Kapoor. He is uh, he pretty much got some sort of an exclusive license to use Vanta Black in his art. So that was very controversial among artists who wanted their hands on it. Um, I looked into that. It, it, he only has the license for a specific kind of Vanta Black. There's other Vanta Blacks that he does not have the license to. So um, that out of the way, it was still a, a very controversial thing. A lot of artists were kind of pissed off. And uh, I count myself among them. Yep. Yeah, so there you go. And uh, then um, there was, um, what's his name? Stuart Semple. Stuart Semple. He, he created several versions of, of Black, the latest being a 3.0. Right. Um, and, uh, I, I happen to uh, own some of this and so I can talk firsthand about it. I also uh, own his silver. There you go. Um, and, uh, it, it's, it's wild. <laughs> so, so, so Stuart Temple made his own black and he sold it. He also made, um, I think before he did that, he made the pinkest pink. Which um, which is a color? Well, it is very pink. Um, I've oh, I never for, I always forget to press this button again. Um, so uh, he he made this pink, which again, if you watch a video, there's a video on YouTube that explains it, and you can't really see how pink it is because no camera, no the, you, the screen cannot reproduce the pink. Is that pink? So, but. Uh, 
um, and, the, <laughs> and Stuart Semple added this note that um, Anish Kapoor or his associates could not buy this pink. It wasn't; they weren't allowed <laughs> to buy it. Um, which then I think Anish Kapoor got his hands on it and he posted a photo of his middle finger dipped in pink on Instagram. So it was a bit of a... Color wars. Color, color wars. Color wars. Let's just call it that. So, um, but that put Stuart Semple on the... On the, <laughs> on the map. On, on the map, on the radar of uh, pretty much everyone looking into interesting uh, kinds of colors. And uh, yeah. one of them is the pink is pink. One of them is the black. Well, now it's black 3.0, which I don't even know if it's as good as Vanta Black or not. But it is well, very... You compare. You, you need to a <laughs> paint Vanta Black and his well, black and you put can some measure. light on it. And see you can it. measure. Um and uh, and of course the the glittery is glitter the silvery is <laughs> the, the mirroriest mirror mirror reflective paint and all yeah, sorts of yeah. uh, interesting stuff. So, uh, yeah. How does that relate to photography? One might ask. And that, that was yeah. one of my questions because if you read and let's go back to what we started with the IR flock the 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 cloth that uh, absorbs ninety nine point five percent of the visible light and the near-infrared light. Um, that seems to be more of a scientific use in it. Um, when you, If you read what they claim it's for, it says, okay, it could be a dark curtain material for near-infrared, like non-reflective dark rooms. If you work in infrared, uh, it could be a background curtain for near-infrared photography, which, again, is more on the scientific side, I would uh, argue. Um, or you could use it if you have a near infrared sensor as a kind of a pseudo infrared calibration device. Um, or all of all of those sound very uh, uninspiring. No, to yes, me. totally. But 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 I, I would say getting maybe three or four yards of it and having a bespoke suit made of it. Well, so here's no, the here's, okay, nah, yeah, yeah. here's the thing. I have a backdrop, um, one of those unfolding backdrops that I use for photography, and it's made of black velvet, and it's quite shiny. It, no, it's not. That black velvet is very short in in the hair length, and mm -hmm. it pretty much swallows all the light that I throw at it. So, but you have to be very specific distance from it. Um, I, I, I have a little uh, velvet backdrop that I use, and I, I do find that it still picks up some highlight sheen unless I move it well off the, you know, the spell of any light. Then, that's, then that's you need a better sense. velvet because mine doesn't do that. So, <laughs> I need a blacker black, <laughs> or you need a blacker black. <laughs> well, the, the difference between is anybody uh, else listening to this podcast right now got the <laughs> no, song Black three. Velvet <laughs> running <laughs> through <laughs> their head? And when was that? Late, uh, late, late eight, early 90s, maybe? Oh, yes, black I Velvet. I remember, can't remember that. Can't remember the, the, the sounds like a girl's drink. name. Yeah, it was a song. Sorry. So, so it was a song. Um, um, looking, looking at at the, just the prices of things, a square meter, which is what we do here in Europe, is a square meter of the IR flock is like 50 euros, whereas a square meter of some decent, good black velvet might be like 10 euros per square meter. So it's a significantly cheaper. Um, unless you buy like real velvet, which is made from silk, which is really expensive, but... Um, I find that, and this is my personal experience with the black velvet that I use as a backdrop, um, I find that that is so black that I never really have any issues. The, I have issues when there's a, a bit of dust on it or something that I have to clone out later, because mm. then that really pops out. I can imagine it would make lighting easier. Because, yeah, when you want to keep a background black, you have to make sure that you don't have any spill on it. Yeah, because uh, that that is that is something that as uh, you know, if you're doing that kind of portraiture or, or whatever kind of photography, you get against a, back, a black background and you want it properly black, uh, you do have to make sure you're feathering your lights decently and and what have you. So, so I, I can see it, it's a marginal use. It sounds sounds expensive though. But w wouldn't you agree that it's the same with white? 
It's like if you want a, a balanced white background, you should keep all the lights off and light that separately and balance it separately. Well, if you uh, because yeah, then you, you can always shadows. blast. You can always blast the background as long as you as long as your subject is far enough away from the background that doesn't ah, bounce yes, back long. and wrap around them. You can so that blast the background. That will require this, that as a photographer, maybe you are just a beginning photographer. You might not have the space. You might not have the the amount of lights and that kind of thing. So you, you do need quite a lot of lighting power to do yes. that. It's not something you do just with a single speed light, blast a whole background. But uh, True. Yeah. I, I found that some of the most difficult is when I was making commercials. Some of the most challenging on the technical level was working in a large studio with a huge white space and an individual. It's a little bit easier now because you can lift the mat and all of that. But when you had to light an even white cove background on a massive, you know, sized studio so that you know you, you see them in commercials all the time a little person walking up to camera talking and some logos coming oh you mean Those you mean the quite... the johnny ive room yes yeah <laughs> Basically, those were very challenging to light. I mean, sure. when I say challenging, they were more mechanical because we know what to do, but they took time. They took time and very, very specific measurements to, to make sure that overall there was balance. Same thing on a green screen. Uh, black, of course, is more forgiving, but it still requires <clears throat> adjustment of light, whatever you're doing uh, in terms of background, nothing is just as simple as it seems, um, unless you're using Vanta Black. <laughs> so, so, okay. One, one other thing to kind of complete the picture, and I think we've had it here as a pick of the week a while ago, is the whitest paint ever that scientists have uh, revealed a uh, a month ago. Well, less less than a month ago, um, and they have a white paint that reflects 98% of the light, which is significant and uh, more than like any white paper usually does. Mm -hmm. And it's based on the same, it's bar barium sulfate, which is the same thing that is uh, the white in, in Barita paper. So it, it reflects a lot of light. That's pretty much what it does. And that's how Barita paper creates its amazing contrast because the whites are so much whiter than with other paper and uh, they are yeah they claim that they have developed the whitest paint so my question uh going into this episode i think is do we really need these things for photography or um how much do we need them do we are there ways around them and uh, again looking at someone who might not have the means to do this or the space or um, the lighting power to, to separate I, I this. think you could do that. I mean, you could do a lot of what we're talking about can be done digitally. In other words, you can... Very true. You, you, can adjust, you can adjust the gamma, you can adjust the depth of black screen or print, and we'll get into yep. that in a moment because I have a little... I want to expand this a little from paint uh, to inks. Very but good. but as as we as we kind of use digital to create a white uh, over which it cannot be projected or reflected, ditto with blacks. You just there's no information there. It's like yeah. recording digitally at a certain point if you're um, too um, high in in your dynamic range. There's nothing there, so it, it's a zero. Uh, we all know that when when a, a kind of a an image is what we call blown out highlights, a little bit different than a blown out highlight on film and digital. Digital tends to just look crappy because of the, I guess the, the, the kind of that, that area between the white and the first tone of white that you can see. So digital is one way of kind of end around, but there's also something that's very interesting with these paints, which is why, <laughs> why do I own them? You might well ask. <laughs> well, which, which why one? do you own which, them, Jeremiah? Yeah, Jeremiah, why do you own them? Tell, tell us. Tell us. <laughs> oh, you've asked. And <laughs> odd. <laughs> I never thought of that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've been working. I haven't shown any of these images, but I've been working on, for example, painting objects and models and whatnot in a kind of a small desktop studio lighting and making things slightly disappear or half disappear 
um, and creating those kinds of illusions that almost look digital, but they are all in camera. And as as somebody who's explored making digital work look real, I'm trying to make real work world look digital. Uh, you know, I don't know why this is an obsession of mine, but it is. And it's got to be a lot easier the other way around, though, right? Because <laughs> that's 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 one of the things that I constantly find when I see an example of someone. I don't know. There was this BMW that was painted in Vanta Black, and yeah, I it saw looked that, yeah. the, the photo of it looked completely fake. It looked like someone it cut did. it out in a digital yeah. in, in Photoshop, and and uh, yeah. So 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 my question is, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I think Jeremiah has just given us some insight. It is the contrariness of the artist. It is, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think there are surprising things that happen. So, for example, if you paint an object with Vanta Black, part of the, the object, then it effectively disappears. But then if you paint over that with silver or pink, you can start to create a, an objective reality that, in a way, makes no sense to the eye. And You're it's confusing, to, that's for sure, yeah. Yeah, and somewhere in that confusion lies my interest. Uh, I, I'm not saying that I've arrived at any uh, ex exhibition-level printing that I would like to show, nor an NFT that I would like to mint. Just staying on <laughs> on subject. I have to say that in every single episode. Now. What, what does it um, do to the real eye, though? Because you know, so when if you paint, if you if you're working at this in your in your little desktop studio that you've described, mm. can, do, does it when you when you? I mean, you, clearly you're you're you are preparing objects with the with the medium of photography and then printing in mind. But what what does it look like when you look at one of these things that is partially painted with Vanta Black or whatever? Yeah, does it? You mean in real it, life, not not through in the real life? Eye of a yes, camera, sorry. Oh, in real life with your human eyes. Yes, it's fantastic. It's really really a great illusion. Uh, like I've been working on a rock, just a just a a stone. <laughs> And I, you know, tape half of it and paint half of it very crisply, Vanta Black. And then you put it on, a, say, a white background and light it very carefully, like any kind of tabletop. And you just have no idea what you're looking at. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, I, I, I have a a uh, a model of a, I don't know, a, a, like a Ford or a, yeah. A, uh, basically a, a Bronco. And uh, I haven't had the time to put it together, but my, my goal is to paint it Fanta Black, but light the interior. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, and, 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 and again, things that you really, it would be very hard to do in real life. And um, I, and go ahead. I, I think I understand the appeal for art that you see in person like you go to an exhibition there's yeah. a rock that's half painted black and your mind is blown in a way and <clears throat> you see a little bronco that is vanta black and it's lit from the inside and you're you, you can't put it together in your mind because it's so far outside of your uh of your normal perception level and uh so so that i totally get but in photography the moment you try to shoot something like that the dynamic range of your of your camera isn't nearly as good as our eyes are so so um you you see these things more often in camera that something is completely black because there wasn't enough light so they're not enough photons made a or, ma or made a silhouette yeah. or make make a silhouette and that's mm -hmm. kind of kind of a, a, a thing that we can compute in our mind when we see it on a photo because we know that the, or we instinctively know that the dynamic range of that medium is different and uh when so when you shoot something like this it will instantly the pattern that you see will instantly match to someone having photoshopped something so um, uh, i think i think what you just said is fantastic and 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 i agree and a lot of uh my kind of experimental uh use of this is really about trying to figure out what does look amazing in real life uh to try and do some things on a bigger scale in you know in sort of meat space rather than digitally right but I think it, it could get very interesting, for example, and this is like, 
If you paint a model car, light it from the inside, vent it black, and drape fabric over it. Uh-huh. I mean, I, mean it, I, I fully understand that this is the creative process and this is an exploration and it's new and yeah. it's, it's, it's not something that, that, that you will instantly know what to do with it. You have to play. You have to really play yeah. with it to get to the point where you go, oh, wait a minute, this works, this doesn't work, and so on. Right. So and I that's get where this. I'm, I get I'm, I'm at that right now. So um, I'm, I'm not really you know, expecting any any answers from 20 years of experience or something. No, it's it, it's just a very interesting yeah. approach when something has like lasers. When I mean, it's the same issue. I mean, I explored you know using lasers. I think we've talked about this in holography many many years ago, and we would use a red laser you know it has a very specific wavelength and so the color is very specific you can't really capture it on film or no, any other way but but to the eye that red is as red as red could be to the eye yes uh, is it vanta red <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's actually better because it's a hundred percent of the wavelength i mean it, it it's pretty good but Again, the exploration of these things, not knowing how to use it, is also a fascination for me personally because I'm also interested in different kinds of printing inks. And when we talk about the blackest black on on a paint surface or using paint, uh, I've also been pursuing the blackest black that I can find um, in terms of of how it will print on an inkjet printer. Um, and I dare say, I think my, my prints um, are, they're very intense on the black, but they have, they have a huge dynamic range or a beautiful dynamic range, shall I say, you know what I mean? Right up to white or, or perceived white. Um, when you have that black 2.2, wh- whatever you want to call it, however, you know, for your monitors and whatnot. When it's as black as black could be with nothing in it, and then you start to climb out of it in that, I guess, zone system, to use old vernaculars, that black defines everything around it. Mm -hmm. Um, In in a way, maybe more than white does. The black point point is key, totally, absolutely. Key, key. And so it becomes, when you start to play with paint in, in real life to the eye, and and piezo inks, which uh, will be, I, I kind of threw up something we, there. We've, we've had them here on here before. Yeah, so, I've, um, I've show them here, to th- us. There's a, yeah, here's a, you know, you can see, just scroll down for a moment. Uh, no, 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 or up, scroll up, right to the top of the page. You see, uh, these are all different combinations of these inks, you know, and and the. Carbon is a little warmer. Special edition is a mixture of some of these of selenium and warm neutral. And I, the the creator of these inks, uh, John Cohn, who's just a genius in um, uh, in in Vermont, and and his work with Roy Harrington, who who um, has created these um, printing software. Uh, programs to enable the amount of ink very specific to the tone of the image to be applied to a very specific paper absorbency. So the control you get in terms of being able to create that velvety black and build everything on top of it is really amazing. And these inks are handmade and they're ground and they're there. And you could see, uh, you know, again, you don't get a great image on the screen. It doesn't really. It doesn't translate, no. How subtle and beautiful these these um, um, tonal shifts are. But they're, they're it, it's, it's a website well worth exploring. And, um, and I, you know, it, it's not, It's not an easy transition to use piezography, and not all printers uh, can be modified. Um, uh, Printing companies uh, like Epson and and the rest are trying to make it more difficult to use third-party inks. So you tend to you you tend to use older printers that are refurbished; they're harder to find. 
and 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 but uh, the end result is pretty amazing so are there are uh, there vanta black or black 3.0 printer <laughs> inks available yeah i would say that the piezography carbon black hd is probably the blackest ink that i've ever seen okay. it's very black so it gets close to what these things can do yeah so on on print it does in other words if i'm printing right. black it doesn't seem that there's any reflectivity at all and i'm using a hanamule um you know a flat matte piece of paper um i don't you know print those things on any kind of gloss or burrito so so if you get the uh if you get the blackest ink and you print it on the whitest paper does that give you an hdr print that'll blow your brain Te technically i mean i'm not i'm not i'm not you know taking the piss is it does that is that effectively the highest dynamic range you can get on a print if you get the blackest black and the whitest paper i would think so uh yeah Yes, but the whitest paper tends to be a paper that has been coated. Well, what, what right. if we look at Berita paper uh, in photography, the reason those Berita silver prints are so mind-blowing is because the paper is so white. So you have a big mm -hmm. contrast between the black from the silver and the white from the paper. Um, and then plus, it's usually treated in a way that it gets glossy. So... You have a, a glossy surface that increases the the, the perceived uh, dynamic range of the paper. So you you see something that that pops that really pops. And here in in the digital context, in the inkjet context, what we're looking at is possibly also a very bright paper with a coating on it. Plus, then we have an additional um, very dark ink, so that that contrast range right. is very big. Yeah, it's, it is. So, so, so. What is that? Oh, the squirrel only... is back. The vid video oh, yeah, watchers That's can see <laughs> right <that>. now. <laughs> You're being okay, watched. This is, a, this is a good plug for for the TFOP Discord, isn't it? Come and it join is, the TFOP Discord another, server, everybody. Where squirrel we is is well, trying to get into my studio. Where we have a channel all about <laughs> squirrels and gerbils and rats and other and please other animal visit. photos. It's endlessly fun. Anyway, it is. So, it Jeremiah, is. this picture, please post it on the. Uh, on the discord for sure absolutely um, yes one one of the things that you were talking about in terms of that bleached white look is i find that those papers and i when i print color on those things it's very snappy very contrasty very rich but piezography though they do make a color uh ink set that i have never used the the black and white printed on that kind of burrita style paper um, won't allow the blacks to be absorbed as much as the flat matte papers. Mm, okay. So it, it tends to sit on top of, which by its nature is more reflective. So you're never going to get that absorbed where the ink sits into the paper. The light moves into the ink and all light is captured in those nanoparticles <laughs> so Never to let me let me, let me try to bring this back around to uh kind of the initial <laughs> question do we need this how much do we need it and i think jeremiah what you're showing us is a very uh very high-end kind of uh use of these things but i would expect a lot of people listening to this to to not be at that level so I would still I'd say, say no. as <laughs> it's completely useless. <laughs> no, I think it's niche. I think it is useful for, but but maybe in a niche case because the thing is, you're going back to just the the scenario we were talking about earlier in terms of like you know taking portraits. Um, I I have just a bit of old black fabric that I bought from a, a fabric shop. It was a cut off the end of a roll, which I use as a backdrop some sometimes for for portraits. Uh, but I do like the fact that, you know, it, it, at a push, I can tint it so I can put a purple light on the background and just get a little bit of purple out of that black just to provide a bit of contrast or a bit, a bit of color to, you know, to, to, to provide an edge. Um, or I can feather the lights and keep it as black as I like so that the sensor doesn't pick up anything off it at all. So I think, you know, for me, I, I think I prefer the fact that I have some flexibility over backdrops. You know, you, know, you get a get a, a grey backdrop. You can make it any colour you like, can't you? Really, if, if you know, within reason. And uh, so, but but I think there's a niche thing. I think it'd be great for negative fill. I think if you really needed some strong negative fill, then the Vanta Black would be awesome. Oh, definitely. <laughs> I, I, 
Yes, and I, also it, once the price is is uh, reduced and um, you know you can have it in a spray can, uh, I can see just killing reflections with a little. Pfft. Spray, that that is that, a, that is a tech that is a technical oh. solution for for lighting problems, um, yeah. But let let's say you just want some dark black type of background that swallows a lot of light, but that's easy to handle. That doesn't rub off. That doesn't cost like fifty bucks a square meter. Um, I would go for it for something like <laughs> stage velvet. Stage yeah, velvet I, I, is what you usually find on stages that need very black backdrops, and they uh, that that is really comparatively cheap and still very yeah. effective so that's and uh, i have i ha the the velvet that i've been using for my background is silk velvet and and that is shinier yeah that's it. silk velvet or velour yeah. is kind of the longer haired yeah. velvet that is very shiny mm -hmm. that's the one that yeah. you can actually paint on by rubbing over it so um definitely yeah on the shelves. Use Vanta paint over with Vanta black. And, yeah, just, just dip it in Vanta black. Yeah. <laughs> just just thinking back though, actually, to podcast, we did a we did a show, can't remember what number it is, a while back, uh, called something like the future of the headshot, where I was experimenting using the uh, the the stage light mono effect or whatever it's called, you know, that that you get in iPhones these days. Um, it reminds me, I haven't really used a black backdrop since it discards that was invented. the backdrop anyway, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, so something like yeah, you know, th these are things that you know for the the vast majority of photographers, you know, the the that this is what Vanta Black is going to compete against, isn't it? It's going to compete against computational photography. Yeah, yeah which brings us to what Chris was saying. In in other words, if if all of this in photography can be done with from AI all the way to just manipulating contrast. Um, then, you know, is there a point in real life to use them? I, I think your, uh, you know, analysis of how it works in the real world as a illusion is something that is really quite exciting. Um, it's why I, I honestly looked for some fabric to make a suit of because if, if you had a um, totally black suit... There's a video. Like there's a video of a guy who does that. Uh, who did that? He he yeah. wrapped himself in this IR uh, flock cloth and he yeah. disappeared. And it, yeah. Walking silhouette. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think that that kind of thing is is interesting. Um, but real world applications will have a lot more effect on the emotive reaction of a viewer than a photo. Uh, because yeah. we all know all the tricks that that uh, photographic in camera, out of camera, or software can do. But uh, th thanks, Adrian, for bringing that around to one of our favorite topics: the computational photography. Because, of course, that will that that changes <laughs> a lot of things. So, yeah. so the future of headshots was actually episode one five nine. It was published first time on the sixteenth of December, twenty twenty. Um, uh, and that, the, the story behind that episode was that I'd been taking some headshots using uh, what at that point was a, a new phone camera for me. Uh, and uh, I was quite impressed by the the capability of the, the stage light mono, I think is the name of the effect. The built-in uh, iPhone effect, yes. It, the built -in, yeah, in the stock camera app, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Uh, but having said that, I think if I was going to have a car painted in Vanta Black, it would have to be an Aston Martin. It sounds like an Aston Martin sort of thing, maybe because they make a car called the Vantage. I don't know, but Vanta Black, a Vanta Black Aston Martin sounds. At yeah. night, that would be a hell of a accident. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an accident waiting to happen for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and an Aston Martin. I'd go with an old clunker yes. to begin. Yeah, had a, okay, roll, had a roll cage inside. Yes, <laughs> there's, a, exactly. there's a learning yeah. curve. Well, I didn't say I wouldn't switch the lights on. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, a, Formula, a Formula One car would be fun to paint in. Uh, uh, well, it could be interesting. Yeah, it could be. Would be. <laughs> anyway, I think I think we we should leave what. That means for the future of photography, we should leave that to the imagination of the listeners. Maybe you can let us know on the Discord. Um, it's linked in the show notes. 
So get in touch. Maybe I, maybe I maybe someone really, listening has yeah. experience with these kind of things and has played with it in, in a photography I think experimenting, context. Experimenting experimenting is what we want to encourage here, both in kind of real life and in photography. So, you know, playing with backgrounds, white, black, and painted backgrounds, exterior, interior objects. Shoot them just to just to get your eye trained on yes. what the effect of these things are in the middle between black and white. There's a whole world, and when you create the the kind of set points, um, you'll find that your reactions are quite different. To so that that's an reality. excellent segue to my pick of the week, Jeremiah. If that's where <laughs> we're going next, Chris, we're going there. <laughs> so what oh, is your pick case of the week? I'll beg to go first then. So, so uh, actually, do you know what? I'm going to plug a mate of mine this week uh, in my pick of the week uh, because a friend of mine, a chap by the name of Stephen Dowling, has a new Kickstarter. Uh, now, those that may that, that don't know the name uh, may recognise the the brand, uh, the brand Cosmo Photo. Heard of it? Which is. Uh, which is uh, a film, a film brand, as in photographic film brand. Uh, and there's a Kickstarter open at the moment. It opened, as we record this, it opened about 24 hours ago, I think. Uh, and uh, this is for a new Cosmo Photo 35 millimeter film. And uh, to keep us on message for this episode, uh, I'm pleased to say this film has both the colours. Uh, it has black and white. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> The film is called Agent Shadow, uh, and uh, the, there's a whole uh, the, the, there's a whole theme behind this, you know, the, uh, about Agent Shadow. Um, one of the things that is is just a, a, a splendid extra on top of having good quality film is, is the branding around Cosmo Photo products is awesome, um, uh, and this is no exception. So this is a 400 speed black and white film. Uh, it's called Agent Shadow. Uh, the, the the graphic design of it great. You can buy, you can uh, you can if you invest in this through the Kickstarter, you can get a, a re- I think they call them rewards. And one of the rewards is a, a lockable briefcase box in a in a sort of nineteen fifties <laughs> noir style, noir, which has yes. a few rolls of film in it and and a graphic novel. There's a graphic novel that they've created around this character Agent Shadow that that's is, is yeah, only available on the Kickstarter. So Love so that's 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 my plug for a friend of mine um you know go support him um it's, it's a yeah fantastic thing all for it wonderful any 120s yet or just all 35 uh they do so they, this is their second film so that they the first film is called uh cosmo photo mono and that's a 100 speed black and white film uh they have the 120 in that this is just 35 mil to start it's yeah easier to make easier to and and yes probably yeah. sells better than 120. Uh, Jeremiah, your pick of the week. Well, in honor of all things English and in honor of Stuart Semple, <laughs> here is a bag of dirt from England that you could buy for 10 pounds. Oh, you should <laughs> have said I could have dug some out of my garden and sent it to you in the post. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, this is it. <laughs> I, um, you know, who needs a pet rock when you can buy a bit of Jolly Old? It is available to anyone. Um, I've got have, loads of this stuff. It's just lying so around, it's just lying around outside my network. house. Yeah. You don't have to be a high net worth individual looking for it. Adrian, you. but but you're not an artist. Not, not one who's selling How art. How dare you? How well, dare not, you? You're not selling <laughs> art. Let's put it that way. So that's Stuart Semple, who obviously has a great sense of humor about all things uh, color or whatever. But uh, (laughs) I thought that was pretty good. And it would be really amusing if that is the thing that made more money than all the paints. Ah, It's more more real than an NFT, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) Possibly. You can hold it in your hand. So my uh, pick of the week it has nothing to do with this episode. It's a little project that I just finished. Um, and it's just a documentation project. Um, so uh, I'll have to, I'll have to uh, go a bit deeper here. My parents used to run a business back in my hometown. And it was a construction business. And uh, like they built, fa- they built like halls and, and, and houses and things like that. So... Um, one of the things that I remember from my childhood in the place I grew up in is the cinema and the advertising 
in like ahead of the movie and that it used to be a slideshow like they would oh, advertise wow. okay. they would advertise the local ice cream shop and the local bookstore mm -hmm. and uh oh. And the business of Same. my parents. And they have just um, <laughs> cleared out the basement of things. And what came out is uh, several packages of medium format glass slides, hand-designed wow. slides that um, advertise the company of my, of my parents. And wow, it cool. is, it is graphic design from the... 60s and the early 70s and some photos in there and um, it it just is one of these amazing finds so i did a little like documentation project i should i shot That's those great. i i documented them i put them on a little web page we're gonna link that and um f i remember how every single time i was in the in the cinema at at that young age that I was so terribly bored about these slideshows because they were like <laughs> really, really boring. But I ended up, um, yeah, finding those. And these are the boxes with the price on That's it. That's awesome. Like two, two, 26 Deutschmarks for 10 slides. The, the graphic designer is there. I mean, just look at these. It's so brilliant. The colors, the, the designs, the fonts, the like everything uh, of it is really oh, that's nice. Chris, fantastic. Chris, Chris, I'm smelling some NFTs here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm I'm smelling fame because what happened is that my I, I sent this to my parents and they were like super proud and they were really happy. I got a phone call from my dad like five minutes after I sent them the the address of the website. I put this on its own domain. Um, my mom immediately <laughs> sent this out to friends and um, like my my parents are seventy five and eighty, so. They've really like spent their entire life in this company. Um, and then a day later, I get a call from the local newspaper of my hometown. And they want to do a story about this, like an entire page. So everyone's like, really, oh, this is amazing. And I've, I'm just you know, You know what you should do? You, you should do, uh, honestly, make a little um, art book of it. You know what I mean? A self-published art book. Uh, yeah. These, these are enough, absolutely yeah. beautiful and should just be out there. Um, why not? It'd be easy. You've done all the work. Yeah. So, yeah. That would be easy. like a nice lay flat book. Exactly. So that you yeah. could appreciate them. Yeah. You just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. And then yeah. you'll get sued by the designer. <laughs> you get sued by I try to find the designer. I, I try to oh, find the right. designer. His name is on the, on the, on the packages, but, um, no one to be found with that name in that, uh, vicinity who, who would have anything to do with graphics or illustrations so probably not anyway i think Great that project. brings us to the end of this episode of the black is black the white is white the pink is pink the mirroriest mirror the that is really hard to say isn't it <laughs> what else what else what else did they did they have the dirt they had english the dirt, dirt. Dirtiest english dirt. Dirt. <laughs> dirt sample quite something yeah and, oh, uh, I'm gonna go. My, I'm gonna go and dig a hole in my garden in after this. <laughs> that's great. There's money to be made. Bespoke. Yeah. That's yeah, it's I all think clay that's... here, though. My my house is built on clay. Does that count? Is that saleable? I don't it's know. It's another, you know, it's another product. Yeah. <laughs> it is. <laughs> you can it. <laughs> well, the problem is someone else had this idea first and made money with it. So <laughs> probably <laughs> not not gonna work. Anyway, that's it for this week. Thanks everyone for watching. We'll be back in a week from now. Take care. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. <laughs>